I'm going to talk about several hot topics within breast cancer. What's new? What's true? And we'll do this in a true-false means, and I'll go through these one at a time with you. American women fear breast cancer more than any other condition. There's an epidemic of breast cancer. Is that true or not? A diagnosis of breast cancer is a death sentence. The only way to prevent this disease is to have your breasts removed. There is a natural way to prevent breast cancer. So let's look at this. First of all, what do women fear in terms of diseases? And study after study has shown we fear breast cancer far more than any other condition. One can argue whether we should or not, but that is true. Is there an epidemic of breast cancer? What you're looking at here are rates of new cancers in American women over the last 35 years, several cancers, each with their own colored line, and at the very top is breast cancer, certainly far more common than any of the others. Is it an epidemic? Well, you can see as you look at that line, the rates have actually been pretty stable since the early 80s when screening was introduced. So it is common, but it is not an epidemic. Is it a death sentence? Let's remember this picture. 300,000 US women are diagnosed with breast cancer every year. This uh, graph shows deaths from cancer in US women. And it goes back to 1930. So we're looking here at basically 80 years of data. Try to make out the pink line right in the center, and you will see that as of about 1990, so 23 years ago, deaths from breast cancer began to decline. Good news. Why? Screening, in part. Better treatment, in part. Now, if we put these numbers together, as I said, about 300,000 new diagnoses in US women every year. About 40,000 women die of breast cancer in this country every year. And if we do the math, about 15% of women diagnosed with this disease, one five, will succumb to it, meaning that 85% will survive their disease long term. It is not a death sentence. Here's part of the reason that it's not a death sentence. And what, I've shown, what I'm showing you here, as you look from left to right, are different breast cancers. And there's great heterogeneity in this disease. Toward the left-hand side of the continuum, it may be cancer, but it has just a small complement of the skills of a cancer. Uh, if we put terrorism colors on it, these would be highly unlikely to spread and take a life. As we move along the continuum, there are more abnormalities, but still a more intermediate disease, very likely to be curable with our treatments. And then to the far right of the continuum, nasty cancers, very aggressive, able to spread into neighboring tissue, get into the bloodstream, take root in a tissue where they don't belong, like the liver or brain, and survive. So many breast cancers occupy this left-hand side of the continuum, even though they have the name cancer, but they are not likely to cause death. As oncologists, what we need to do is sort out where is a particular cancer on a continuum like this and match the aggressiveness of the treatment to the aggressiveness of the disease. If we, we've talked a little bit about genomics, here's a woman's chromosomes from normal cells. This is what things should look like. Some of these low-grade or better-risk breast cancers might have chromosomal makeups like this. There might be one or two genetic abnormalities. 
Here is a wild and aggressive breast cancer not following any of the rules of normal citizenship within a tissue. It has many skills that it should not have. That's the more aggressive type of cancer. <clears throat> Just as in the treatment of a cancer, <clears throat> we want to match the aggressiveness of the treatment to the aggressiveness of the disease, so too when we're trying to prevent a cancer. So the average American woman has roughly a 10% chance of developing breast cancer if she lives to the average life expectancy today of about age 81. That's average. Some women have an increased risk. Uh, a substantial number, in fact, do from family history or other factors. Some have an even greater risk, uncommon, however, and very uncommonly, we see women with extremely high risk of breast cancer. Again, as we look at the population, we want to match whatever we might conceive of in terms of prevention to what the woman's risk is. You've seen many, many media stories about Angelina Jolie's decision to have her breasts removed, and she had what she described as an 87% risk of developing breast cancer. I don't know how that calculation was done. Clearly, very high risk, making her decision understandable to us. And while we may um, really admire her for coming out as she did, talking about this publicly, we have to remember that she is in a very rare subset of women. This does not apply to those at average or slightly higher risk. Well, what I really want to talk to you about is some new work. Could there be a natural way to prevent this disease? And to do that, I need to remind you of a little bit of anatomy. The breast is a milk-producing gland composed of lobes, each with a large duct that ends on the nipple. Within each lobe is the functional apparatus of the breast, and these are called lobules. This is a microscopic slide of normal breast tissue populated with these small lobules. You see the inset, and that's one of them. Within a lobule are multiple tiny little glands where milk production occurs. The milk exits through tiny ducts into ever larger ducts and so on. Normal breast tissue. This anatomic structure that makes milk is the same anatomic structure where cancer can develop. That's where the majority of the cells of the breast are. This is another normal breast uh, picture. The lobules are gone. This is probably an older woman, slightly older. The lobules have regressed. It's still normal breast tissue. This process where these milk-producing lobules, with time as a woman gets past childbearing age, regress, is natural, normal, called age-related lobular involution. Interestingly, it has not been studied very much at all. It is very different from what happens after breastfeeding is complete, when weaning has happened, where lobules go back to their normal size, but they do not disappear because you want to be able to have another pregnancy. This process does begin before menopause, but it really accelerates at menopause after childbearing is, is uh, no longer possible. And these tiny lobules are replaced by connective tissue and fat. Now, we are interested in normal breast biology as a part of trying to understand what goes wrong in the development of breast cancer. And women who have had a, a, a lump in the breast or an abnormal mammogram may need a breast biopsy. Many times that is benign. 
So we have, with their support and willingness, created a cohort, a large group of women, about 14,000 over a 35-year period. We have these slides, two of which I've shown you. And we have followed all of these women so that we know who later developed breast cancer, enabling us to compare the findings in the benign tissue, what correlates with risk of a later breast cancer. So our pathologist, Dan Vischer, pictured here, and he was working with a medical student on this project, had an interest in this process of age-related lobular involution. No one had ever asked the question, could this be associated with breast cancer, yes or no? So Dan, as he was looking at many of the features on these slides, made a note of the extent of this process of involution that had occurred for every one of those 13,500 women. And the answer is that if this process has happened, the risk of breast cancer is dramatically lessened, which makes sense because these are the structures from which breast cancer arises. In fact, women who should have been at higher risk because of their family history or other findings, if the involution program had successfully been completed, their risk was back to average. Interestingly, women postmenopausal who for some reason were still retaining these lobular structures had a significantly increased risk, consistent with our hypothesis. What you're looking at here are a couple of autopsy hole mounts taken right through a breast from the back to the front. You can see in the lower panel those tiny black dots all around the, the gland. Those are tiny lobules above a, a different breast, probably a woman who is somewhat older, the lobules are gone. Involution has occurred. When we published our findings on this, uh, an editorial writer said, you know, the result of involution could be considered a physiologic prophylactic mastectomy. Quite an interesting concept. So we are pursuing this on a number of levels. For one, we can look at the slide. Here you see a non-involuted lobule, a normal lobule on the left, an involuted one on the right. One can use this information as risk prediction information for a woman. We are also using genomic technologies to understand what's the genetic genomic changes within involuted tissue versus not. What genes are driving this program? What genes are stalled when it doesn't happen? What could we do with that? Well, the idea would be if the process has stalled in a woman where it should be completed, if we can figure out what mediates it, maybe we can promote it with uh, targeted prevention, if you will. Once some of these genes are identified, what we can do today, here's a mouse. This mouse has been genetically altered so that it would accept human tissue and not reject it. You can take human breast tissue from women with different degrees of involution, remove the mouse's mammary gland, put the human in, and basically uh, expose that tissue to different agents, different um, stresses, and see if we can promote the process in a positive way. So summing up, going back to our questions that we've addressed, women fear breast cancer, most definitely that is true. There's an epidemic of breast cancer, no. It's a death sentence, false. The only approach to prevention is double mastectomy, most definitely false, while that is an option for women at very high risk. 
there is natural prevention, we believe that there is, and we're working to try to sort out how that might be brought forward clinically. Thank you very much for your attention. A couple of things. I mean, breast cancer is about the change that takes place in tissue, right? I mean, cancer, you go from non-cancerous to cancerous, it's a transformation. Yeah. Um, and yet you say that the, the, the study of the natural process of tissue change within the breast, involution, right. had never really been studied before. Why would, if the disease is all about tissue change, wouldn't you be studying those tissue change processes that already occur? Yeah. It's a great question, and, and I think we sometimes err in medicine on focusing on the abnormal, and we, and we work on it and work on it and work on it, and so much has changed. Look at the chromosomes of, of that cancer that I showed. Reining that in is a tall order. Let's focus on what's working, what, where the programming is there, and how can we harness that. That's the transform kind of nugget that we look for, you know, moment to moment at this conference. We focus too much on the abnormal. It's sort of the natural processes that provide equal numbers of insights, if not more insights. What triggers, I mean, certainly menopause is triggered by a huge kind of onset of endocrine, glandular, this, that, and the other thing. I mean, I don't know what I'm talking about, but... <laughs> um, it's, a, it's a big sort You're doing of, good. You're it's a, it's a large-scale <laughs> event. What triggers the involution, though, on the tissue level within the breast? Do we even know? We suspect that there are at least two major elements. One is your own inherited program that you receive. Uh, we do see that women with a strong family history of breast cancer may have a tendency to have this process delayed. So there's some inherited background, but certainly hormonal regulation uh, plays a large role in it as well. Are we at the stage where we can even begin to sketch out possible therapies to bring involution onset at, on the right schedule in high-risk patients? No, no, not at this no. time. But we're, there are more and more labs getting involved in this work. I, I think over the next few years we'll, we'll be learning some interesting findings. Dr. Hartman, thank you so much. Okay.